if I asked you a question, I'm, I'm interested in a show of hands, actually. If I asked you how many of you think marijuana is addictive, put your hand up. Not a whole lot. Well, actually, it's a sprinkling of minority. How many think it's not addictive? Most of you think it's not. What if I said it's both, which it actually is? Uh, if I asked you, is alcohol addictive? Yes or no? Yes? How many think it's not addictive? Well, think about it, though. If it was addictive, how many of you, most people in this room have had alcohol in their lives, but the number of alcoholics in the room is probably in the minority. So if alcohol is addictive, how come we're not addicted to alcohol, all of us? We've all had it. The point is, and the same thing is true of any substance, virtually any substance, whether it's marijuana or, um, or alcohol or nicotine or heroin or cocaine or crystal meth. The answer to the question, are they addictive, yes or no, is actually yes or no, depending on the individual. There are people that can be, become addicted to it, and I've seen that as well. By addiction, I mean any behavior, substance related or not, that a person engages in, finds temporary pleasure or relief in, but suffers negative consequences, and they still don't give it up. So addiction means pleasure, craving, relief, negative consequence, inability to give it up. And there are some people that will use marijuana that way. And of course, the adolescent population is precisely the population that legalization is not going to affect one way or the other in the sense that they can already get all the drugs they want, all the marijuana they want, and they will continue to get it. Even if you set the legal age for the purchase of marijuana, let's say 19 or 20 or whatever, wherever they choose to set the, the limit, the fact is that's not going to stop adolescent marijuana use. But as providers or as people working medically or otherwise with the plant and its products, we should really be aware of the potential risk that so far fairly persuasively demonstrated uh, to the adolescent brain. But let me also begin by saying that, well, it's very interesting. In Colorado, which was the first state to legalize marijuana, who was the very first person to buy marijuana? Anybody know? He was an Iraqi war vet. Not accidental. Because a lot of those people suffer PTSD. And I know my friend Philippe, who introduced me, is now involved in a project to study the use of cannabis in the treatment of PTSD. So that's a frequent self-medication. The mayor of Denver, Colorado, of course said this is a terrible thing because he's seen all these people begin marijuana as the gateway drug and then they become addicted to all kinds of other substances. Well, he, 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 he's probably describing what he saw. He saw people using marijuana and then using other drugs, but he may as well have said Coca-Cola because people drink Coca-Cola at a much earlier age than they start using marijuana and then they go on to become drug users or soda water or, or O. Henry bars. You know, in other words, just because something precedes the use of something else doesn't mean that A led to B. And there's absolutely no evidence that marijuana is any kind of a gateway drug to anything. How then do we approach and how then do we um, understand addictions and how do we differentiate between addictive use and, and, and not addictive use? It's not a, it's not a trivial question. I wish I could tell you that marijuana is in all cases harmless. And when I wrote my book on addiction, which came out in 2008, the research I looked at up to that point on marijuana showed that um, it did not seem to have long-term negative effects on people and that um, there's no such thing as withdrawal from it. Well, research has moved on since then, and uh, it's always controversial, but in 2012, the United States, the um, uh, Proceedings of the National uh, Academy of Sciences published a paper from Britain where they looked at a lot of people over 30, 40 years who began uh, their 
marijuana use in adolescents, and they showed uh, diminished mental functioning in these people. They showed diminished IQ over the years. They showed um, uh, diminished uh, neuropsychological functioning, uh, and according to observers' reports, deterioration in their quality of life as well. They did not show the same thing when it came to people who began marijuana use as adults. So there's definitely a question about what is the impact of this substance on the developing brain of the young human being. Now, the same legitimate question also exists about substances that we legally prescribe to kids. For example, in the US, there are half a million children right now, at least, who are receiving antipsychotic medications. And they're getting them not to, because they're psychotic, they're not. They're getting them to calm them down because we don't know how else to, when I say we, I mean as a society, we don't understand human child behavior enough to be able to regulate it, so we just medicate it. But the long-term effects on the developing brain, not good news. And uh, side effects such as diabetes and weight gain and skin changes and so on, we're already documenting them and having to deal with. So marijuana is not the only substance where we have to be careful. Uh, as I say, some legally prescribed pharmaceuticals seem to be uh, potentially much worse, actually. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be careful with uh, marijuana as well. You can probably show that, in fact, if, if there's a gateway drug, it's cigarettes. Because a lot more people who are drug users start with that than with anything else. But nobody's arguing that cigarettes is a gateway drug. There are no gateway drugs. They're just drugs. But there's probably a good reason why people that begin marijuana use then go on to use other harder drugs. Just as good reason why people who begin with um, cig cigarettes will then go on to use other drugs. Not because the use of the one substance leads to the use of the other, but because who are the people who need to have their consciousness changed? Who are the people that need to have their discomfort soothed by a substance or another? So again, if I give you my definition of addiction, that of any behavior, substance related or not, that a person craves, finds temporary pleasure or relief in, but suffers negative consequences as a result of, and does not give it up despite those negative consequences. I said any behavior, doesn't have to be substances. If I ask you the question in this room, just please raise your hand. How many of you would acknowledge that at some time or another in your life, you've had some kind of an addictive behavior? Yeah, we have about 90% honesty in this room. That's good to know. So when you ask yourself the next question then, in fact, I'll ask you to just raise your hand and tell me. I'm not going to ask you what you used or what you did or when or for how long. I'm interested in what it did do for you. What did you like about it? What did you get from it in the short term? So who would tell me? Escape. Escape from? Feeling. From feeling. Okay, so that, thank you, that implies that the feelings that you had were painful and uncomfortable and stressful. I mean, nobody has to escape from good feelings, right? So it's a relief of emotional pain or emotional discomfort. Fair enough? Okay. Anybody else? What did it do for you? Whatever you did, yeah? Focus. It helped you focus. Great. Sorry? Connection? Connection with other people, you mean? With anything, you just felt more. You just felt more connected to the world. Okay, great. And m maybe take one more. I'm sorry. Creativity. creativity. So creativity, connection, escape uh, from distress and focus. Now you tell me who on earth does not want those qualities? Who on earth does not want to be connected? Who on earth does not want to be focused? Who on earth does not want to be? Sorry, who would you say? The government. The government. I'm talking about rational individuals here. No, no, no. Uh, the uh, connection, uh, relief of distress, um, uh, focus, 
creativity. These are normal human aspirations. In other words, the addiction wasn't a problem. It wasn't your primary problem. Your primary problem was, how come you're on God's green earth with seven billion other people and you're not connected? Your problem is you got so much emotional distress or pain that you need to escape. Your problem is that your creativity is your very nature, but somehow it's blocked and you need to have it unblocked. Your problem is that um, for some reason your brain is unable to focus. So the addiction is not your primary problem, your addiction is your attempt to solve a problem. Therefore, to look up on addiction as kind of a disease that people are born with is absolute nonsense, which is the official medical view, that it's a, a primary brain disease mostly determined by genetics. It isn't any of that. The real question is, what happened to you to block your creativity? What happened to you that your brain did develop, didn't develop the focus? What happened to you that, that you had so much distress and pain that you had to escape from it? These are life experience issues. They're not medical issues. And the addiction in every single case is an attempt to solve the problem. Now, I have relatively little time with you this morning, so I can't go into all the physiology of it. But let me tell you just a few things. First of all, A, as I've just pointed out, addictions are always an attempt to solve a problem, but they're not the primary problem, number one. Number two, the qualities that the addicted individual wants are simply normal human qualities. They just want to feel like normal human beings. That's number two. Number three, people are almost, almost always, in the case of substance use, self-medicating something or other. Now, marijuana is very interesting because uh, again, my friend Philippe has shown in one of his studies, people uh, typically um, self-medicate uh, anxiety and pain and sleep problems with marijuana. That's a self-medication. You know what people also self-medicate? Uh, this is less known, but they self-medicate ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. They self-medicate it not only with marijuana, uh, they also self-medicate it with stimulants. And my guess is you probably had a stimulant addiction. Uh, stimulants are, are, are crystal meth, cocaine, um, nicotine, and caffeine. Um, and these substances give you a rise in the level of a brain chemical called dopamine, which is essential for focus and motivation and the feeling of being present. So the stimulant addict is very often self-medicating ADHD because people with ADHD lack dopamine and they don't know how to focus and they lack motivation. But people also self-medicate ADHD with, um, with marijuana because it soothes. And I, I've been diagnosed with the condition myself, so I know what it feels like internally. And you've got this churning, ever hyperactive brain that you just want to break from every once in a while. And people find that marijuana just soothes the hyperactivity of their brains. So they self-medicate. In fact, a relative of mine, a young man, well, he's in his 20s now, but in his teens, he was a heavy marijuana smoker. In fact, he still is. And I'm rather concerned about it. But uh, I would say to him, without mentioning his name, hey, uh, why are you using so much? He says, well, you won't believe this, Uncle Gabor, but uh, when I smoke marijuana, I can listen better to the teacher. And he was clearly self-medicating his ADHD. Now, he could listen better. What he would remember is a totally different issue. <laughs> p -p probably not very much. But it is a self-medication on that level. And all addictions are. And, and, and particularly, people self-medicate PTSD, for example, with any number of substances, particularly marijuana and the opiates like heroin. And given what you said about escape, and really, which is a form of pain, emotional pain relief, all addictions function as emotional pain relievers. So my mantra when it comes to addiction is not why the addiction, but why the pain. 
And if you understand people's pain, you have to look at their lives. So the people that are at risk for addiction of any sort are the people that have suffered too much pain in their lives.